Hello, my name is David Boyles and I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. And today I want to discuss DRM or digital rights management. Now, whether you're aware of this or not, DRM has actually been in our lives for quite a while. Uh, many people seem to think that it's just come into play recently with uh, the rise of uh, online marketplaces, things like good old games or Steam. But actually, we've been using DRM for 20 plus years at this point, and I'll showcase some of those examples in a little bit. So during this talk, I'm gonna discuss what it is and why it exists, the history behind it, uh, some of the different schemes that are available for software. I want you to understand whether or not you actually own the software you're using or just renting it. Uh, and finally, I want you to know how it works, not only for games and software, but also for media. So let's take this. Uh, this is uh, Us Two Games, the game development studio who created uh, the wildly popular Monument Valley. It was a 2014 breakout success. And uh, at the very beginning of 2015, they went ahead and created a fantastic infographic illustrating what their sales had looked like over this brief period of time. And that covered both iOS and Android, as well as uh, the number of downloads, money that they were making, but in addition to that, the very important statistic that stood out was the number of pirated copies that were available on the internet. So right here, they highlight that only 5% of Monument Valley installs on Android are paid for. That means 95%, nearly all of the people playing their game on Android had stolen the game. On iOS, it's dropped down to 40%, but still, that is absolutely rampant. So I know many people may argue, oh, pirates are there and there's nothing we can do about it, but this is still a bit disheartening to think that 95% of your customers are people who are not paying for your service and are just stealing it. That's uh, heartbreaking. So what is DRM? Well, it's an access control technology uh, that's used to restrict the usage of proprietary hardware and co copyrighted works. And by copyrighted here, I mean it could be software as well. So essentially it's a way of controlling who can use software or hardware at a specific period of time. So it begs the question, do you actually own the software that you're using or are you just renting it from somebody else? Especially when you consider that it comes with such strict licensing terms. So here are some criticisms behind it. Uh, it restricts individuals from copying or using their content legally. So uh, if you perhaps grew up in the 90s playing video games, you may have uh, copied many of your games to disc, uh, or even movies, things like DVDs, with the idea that uh, if I lose this disc or it gets scratched, I wanna have a backup copy so I could play it at some point or save it for the future. And uh, this really came into play as the, the rise of CD technology came out. Um, it came out in the 80s, but in the 90s is when gaming and PCs as a whole really started to use it. Also, people may say information wants to be free, and that's true but the people who are putting their hearts and their time and minds into creating some of this information and software also should probably get compensated for it somehow, right? So here are some common techniques of how it's actually implemented. So uh, restrictive licensing agreements, that is access to content is controlled. Um, so back and forth, you'll see here about court cases of um, people who had uh, bought a CD and then wanted to make a copy of it and a uh, content owner may say, well, you don't actually have the ability to do that. And this is because when you bought the, we'll say audio, the, the, the soundtrack on CD, you bought it for that platform. You bought it to use as a compact disc, not as an audio file as a whole that you could take around and make copies of so you can um, stream over the internet, perhaps to yourself or stream within your home or turn into an individual MP3. Now, you may not necessarily agree with this, but the courts have gone back and forth over the years to discuss this. So I would encourage you to take a look at what some of the latest rulings have been as well. It's interesting. Um, encryption is another way of controlling things. So that is um, the content provider can wrap that content uh, with a bit of security that requires a key or way of decrypting or unlocking the information. Again, that can be audio, it can be a movie, it can be a game that allow people to then view that content. And this is probably the most prevalent, um, at least for digital content that we're viewing today. So you look at things like Netflix, a wildly popular video streaming service, Amazon, Hulu, they all use different forms of encryption, which I'll get into in the very near future as well. So some technology. 
So uh, DRM actually wasn't always, uh, it didn't always involve uh, strict licensing terms, didn't always involve um, high quality and encryption. And you're seeing Apple and the FBI go back and forth about encryption right now. That's a form of um, DRM. But I want to highlight uh, the fact that in the past, uh, game developers were actually using things like um, spinning dials and um, puzzles from uh, game instruction manuals that would allow you to unlock or access the game or content in the game itself. Now, one of my favorite YouTube channels is called Lazy Game Reviews, and um, the person on that channel has a fantastic video called The History of DRM. I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's about 15 or 20 minutes long, and he goes into uh, far greater depth than I could have about different parts of DRM. But with the uh, dial up pirate here, you can see that we're trying to match up the faces and spell a word as you start to turn this dial. And what happens is when you go to launch games, uh, this is often in the 80s, You'll go to launch a game and it will say, oh, I need the code to get in. And the code may be revealed through this uh, puzzle or it may be in the instruction manual as well. I've run this, uh, into this several times myself and I'll, I'll show one of the games that does this too. So DRM and computer games. So game development's my background. I grew up playing games my entire life. So that's where I tend to focus. But also because games tend to be on the cutting edge of technology. So. Uh, one, one way of implementing DRM games is limited install activations. So now, this isn't really popular so much anymore, but 10, 15 years ago, maybe uh, early 2000s, this was actually a very popular way of um, preventing people from installing a game on multiple machines. So someone could perhaps go out, buy a game on disk, uh, install it in their machine, and then give it to friends or sell it online. And now other people also have the ability to do uh, the exact same thing and kind of share this product. So limited installs, uh, not a very graceful solution, but uh, it's one that had existed. Whoops, I wanna go back. Uh, persistent online activation. So always on. That is something like Steam, which recently removed it. So I think you can have like a 30 day grace period if you do something correctly uh, that allows you to play your games without having to reconnect online. Um, so something like Steam is, I would need to have this running in the background, which also doubles as a storefront or a marketplace for me to buy some of these games. I'd need the software running in the background so that uh, I could connect to the servers, authenticate, and be able to go online. You may use something like um, the Adobe Creative Cloud, which includes Photoshop, Premiere, things like that. Um, that actually does a check home, is what it's called. Well, it'll send a, a signal out to their uh, web address and just verify that you're able to connect and therefore allow you to access many of the features available in their software. Uh, software tampering. Um, you can, developers can do what's called a checksum and check that all of the bits are exactly as they should be on the software itself. And it may notice that, hey, if one bit is out of place or has been added or removed, they'll know that someone has um, try to change their software somehow, and for that reason, the software just won't run at all. So it's a pretty tricky situation, too. Um, manual lookup, and this is a passphrase, and I had pointed this out with that pirate card before, um, and actually a, a game in the 90s, uh, Metal Gear Solid, actually implemented this. Uh, see if I when I have this image coming up. And here it is. So uh, Metal Gear Solid, very popular game from Konami on the PlayStation 1. Uh, I remember renting this game uh, probably 1998, uh, I was a young guy, I hopped on my bicycle, rode two miles to Blockbuster in the snow in New York, rented the game, came back, played it, and an hour into the game, you have to make contact over the radio with uh, one of your co-workers in the game, uh, Mei Ling, I believe her name was, but or maybe Merrill. So in order to contact her, you needed this um, uh, radio station number to tune into, a radio frequency to tune into. The problem was that it was printed on the back of the game art, which I have highlighted here. Yes, it's actually Merrill. It's the uh, image, the center on the bottom. So if you go to play the game, you don't have this information unless you have the case. So what I had to do is hop on my bike, drive back to Blockbuster, write down that number on a piece of paper, ride back home. Not what you want to be doing in the middle of the winter when you're a young guy. Um, so that's one form of DRM, again, using manual lookup. Not so graceful, and also what happens over time if you lose the case? Hmm? So here's another example of um, oh, online DRM. Uh, so this is from a review from a Steam game. Got great reviews, right? Grand Theft Auto 4, 90 out of 100. But it also has third-party DRM, and that's Securom. Uh, it has unlimited activations, but 
again, you're gonna have to dial home to their servers to make sure that you've actually bought this authentic piece of software. Uh, again, it's not very graceful. It's not very friendly to the end consumer either. Not a good experience. Here's another example. Um, this is from Game Dev Tycoon. So you can see here in the text, it says sales report. Boss, it seems that many players uh, play our new game. They steal it uh, by downloading a cracked version rather than buying it legally. If players don't buy games that we like, sooner or later, we'll go bankrupt with a sad face. So what's interesting about this is this appears in game, but it only appears in the game when people have pirated it or when the game developer detects that it's a, a, um, a legally acquired copy of the game. So you can still play it, but you get to a certain point where your game studio has to crash and appears with this message. And that's to kind of uh, you know, nudge the player to say, hey, I realize that you stole this game. Um, and because of that, I'm gonna let you enjoy it up to a point. So this is a rather clever way of handling it. Um, Serious Sam was another game about four or five years ago. It did something very similar. It would have a large tarantula kind of, or, or scorpion spawn into the game and come after the player and kill you after a while. So it's interesting to see people go into the forums, ask questions and say, hey, I, this appeared in my game. Uh, you know, how do I resolve it? And the fact of the matter is that they've essentially just outed themselves and said, well, yeah, I basically stole this and that's why I have this. Um, so that's one trick that people have, you know, started to put into the games themselves. So why would someone want to use this? Hmm. Well, I think I showed you pretty well before why um, uh, the other developers, us two software created it, but here, Game Dev Tycoon, that image I just showed you. Uh, so 93.6, so we'll round up to 94% of their customers had illegally acquired the game. That, again, that's devastating to think you put so much time and effort into something and to think that people just took it on their own, didn't want to pay for it. So of the 3,100 users, or 3,100 users stole it, uh, 20, 214 actually paid for it. Now, uh, if it's a game that doesn't require any kind of server connectivity or connection, that's, it is what it is. But, I mean, think about it. If you had a game that required leaderboards and servers, you're footing that bill each month. So the fact that people aren't paying for your game but still making use of your servers, well, that adds up after a while. And that's a large reason why we're seeing um, software as a service or games as a service come out now where it um, you know, requires reoccurring revenue or they'll have lots of in-game, in-app purchases to say, hey, you know, you, we'll give you this game for free. We realize many people are gonna torrent or pirate this software, so at least we can recoup our, our costs on the back end with things like DLC. There is a solution though. I mentioned this before, here is a screenshot of GOG or good old games. So it is DRM free software through a fantastic website, which also doubles as a marketplace and tool for buying these games. Um, often it's older titles, but they do have some very new ones released from time to time. Like we see we have Pillars of Eternity and Witcher 3 highlighted right there. But um, I cannot recommend this place enough because of the great sales, great customer service, great selection of titles. and. Um, and what this essentially goes to show is that we can have great games without requiring strict DRM. And in this case, they have no DRM on their titles at all. Um, so if you offer people a great solution or a great way to find their games, well, you can help circumvent some of the issues of DRM. Um, Steam is a form of DRM in and of itself, although it's not nearly as obtrusive um, as it used to be. So what about audio and video? I mentioned games and software this whole time, but I know you're using things like Spotify and Netflix and Amazon. Well, how do they handle this? Well, here's Netflix. And you see uh, something happened with DRM or the rights here. To resolve this issue, please follow our help steps. Um, I had worked at Comcast before I joined Microsoft and um, there all of our content is behind DRM as well. And this is because content owners, uh, that might be the Viacoms, the Warner Brothers, the Disneys of the world, they want to protect their, their content, rightfully so. They had spent time and money to create this IP. So what this does is it verifies that you're logged into a server or that your account has permissions to view some of this content. So this is just Netflix, but again, most of the uh, large media providers do this. Um, Spotify, if you're using that for music streaming, does it as well. Um, you can uh, download or stream all the music, but um, uh, you're limited to what you can do unless you have a premium account, and that's because their audio is actually wrapped um, in a bit of DRM that prevents you from playing those files on other players. 
So here's some common techniques, at least for video. Um, so Play Ready is a, uh, a DRM technique created by Microsoft in February of 20, uh, 2007. And essentially what it'll do is it will um, encrypt or wrap your video file, it's an MP4, uh, if it's a container, or an H.264 if it's just a video file. It'll wrap it in a uh, protective scheme that says, hey, I can give you this file, but unless you uh, decrypt or unlock it, you're not gonna be able to actually play this content. Apple has something called Fair Play, which is very similar. So what you'll see is a lot of these um, online movie providers or, or video providers uh, will use content like this or techniques like this. Um, and again, here's my uh, very rudimentary drawing of MP4 container. And this container will hold things like the H.264 video file. And H.264 is a compression technique. It might also have subtitles and images. So MP4 is a container. Uh, oddly enough, it can also be a compression technique, but uh, around that MP4 will actually be the DRM itself. What will say, hey, if you do not crack this case, crack this nut, I cannot let you ha access all the content inside of there. Um, and here's a video or an image illustrating how it works. So on the left-hand side, we have multi-bitrate RTMP smooth. So um, that's essentially smooth streaming. I am giving you um, the end user um, uh, a smooth way of displaying information. I'm not going to go into too much detail into this now, but if you look up uh, my blog, daveboyles.com, along with HTML5 video or smooth streaming, I have a whole series of tutorials on how all of this works. But what happens is uh, I can create video content, I can host it online in a server, and I can have a streaming endpoint. Now that's the URL that you would go to to actually view or download some of this video footage that I have. So what happens is you're going to make a request to get this video footage and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that you have to go out to another server with a uh, request key or token that um, will actually unlock this video file. So one call for the video file, another call for the master key to unlock it. And what we may do on our end is say, um, okay, your key is valid. I know that your account has certain permissions. Uh, maybe you have the ability to watch uh, Disney films and you've paid for HBO content. Therefore, the key that I give back, I verified that your account has this uh, ability to view these movies. Um, I'll give you a key back that thereby unlocks um, these specific films or channels or whatever it may be. So that's all I have for you today, but I just wanted to briefly cover DRM, how it works, and some of the many um, uh, techniques that we have available to us today. Again, if you want to know more, you can find my blog, daveboils.com, and my Twitter handle, at daveboils. Thank you.